Hola! This is New Testament video 232, Luke lesson 75. A new chapter, chapter 23 of Luke. We are winding down the gospel record of Luke, two chapters remaining. Luke chapter 23, verse 1. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity here to teach and to learn as we teach. May you bless this time of study as the Holy Spirit teaches us. In Christ's name, amen. Luke 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Matthew. Go back to Matthew. Matthew 27 for the companion. Matthew 27, 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. This is special to Matthew. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor. This is Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, To never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Matthew. Mark 15. Mark 15. For this companion passage, Mark 15, 1. 
And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. John. John 18. John 18. 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. And called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all, no fault at all. It's John. Flip back to Luke. As chapter 23 of Luke opens... We see now the Gentile, the secular, the Roman trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already gone before Annas, former high priest. He stood before current high priest Caiaphas. Finally, he's gone before the Sanhedrin one last time. Those first two hearings, if you want to call them that, proceedings before Annas and Caiaphas, those were illegal, unlawful. Jewish laws were violated there. It was a nighttime trial. So to make it official, to make it legitimate, lawful, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, convened one more time in daylight hours. When it was sunrise, they reaffirmed what they had determined when it was dark. Jesus is worthy of death. 
He's a blasphemer, according to them. Now, according to the Mosaic Law, the blasphemer was to be executed by stoning. Stoning. In Christ's earthly ministry, recall, the Romans reign over the Jews. In John, we just read that, John 18, we'll start here, John 18, 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early. It's early Thursday morning. It's after sunrise. And they, John 18, 28, And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Here is classic religious hypocrisy. The Jews, this horde, this multitude, leading Jesus like a criminal, a violent criminal. He's in shackles, chains, something of that nature. They bring him to the judgment hall. The Praetorium, Mark titles it. Herod's Palace. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Passover is tonight. Remember Jesus ate an early Passover with his disciples. Passover for the rest of the nation Israel is tonight. Twelve hours away. We can't enter a Gentile building will be ceremonially unclean, will be defiled. The Gentiles frequent this area. Oh, we can't enter the judgment hall. Lest we be unable, bored from eating Passover tonight. Think. They've just held illegal trials to wrongfully condemn Jesus. They've recruited, they've enlisted false witnesses to bear false testimony against him. Then they held another trial in daylight hours to reaffirm their prior decisions. They are sending the sinless Son of God to be executed. But they don't want to be 
defiled for the Passover tonight. We want to eat the Passover. We wouldn't dare set foot in that Gentile area, but we will lie about our Messiah, the Son of God, and we'll murder him. Don't have any restraints there, huh? Hmm? But oh, how they're religious. John 18, 29. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then Pilate said unto them, then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Remember our last study. The blasphemer, that's what they consider him, must be stoned as per the Mosaic law. But since Rome is over them politically, dominating them, the times of the Gentiles running here, Israel can't put Jesus to death by themselves. So they approach Pontius Pilate, who's the governor of Judea, the area surrounding Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate is Rome's highest ranking official in this area. Israel's religious leaders must appeal to Pilate. Now, Pilate is a Roman. He won't sentence Jesus to stoning to death. No. Roman mode of execution is crucifixion. The Persians invented that method of death 300 years prior. The Romans perfected the torture there of crucifixion. I'll explain that later in Luke 23. I'll describe crucifixion for you. Won't be pleasant. Pilate. is curious. What did this man do for you to bring him to me? Now watch verse 30, John 18:30. They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, malefactor, a criminal, a wrongdoer, we would not have delivered him up to the... <laughs> what did he do wrong? What is his crime? They don't answer. Huh. John 18, 31. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Remember this in our Matthew study, anyway, long ago, Matthew 20, verse 19. They will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock 
and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. They will crucify me. The Jews wouldn't do that alone. The Jews with the aid of Rome would. So Pilate is involved. The Romans will carry out what Israel wants. If you come back to Luke now, let me teach Luke. Luke 23, 1. Luke 23, 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. Thus far, in Matthew, that would be Matthew 26, and into 27. Mark 14 into Mark 15, Luke 22 into 23. The whole multitude of them arose, the Sanhedrin officials, the, the mob, the temple guards, chief priests, the scribes, Pharisees, the Sadducees would be among the chief priests there, actually. So we have all these long-time enemies of Christ bringing him to Pilate. They're still in Jerusalem, the city of the great king, Look how they are handling the great king. The whole multitude of them arose. He's worthy of death. So let's take him to Pilate. For Pilate to do away with this Jesus of Nazareth. They're fulfilling Bible prophecy. Psalm 2, Psalm 2, Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage, Gentiles, and the people, Israel, imagine a vain thing, the kings of the earth, Gentile rulers, set themselves, and the rulers, Israel's apostate leaders, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The Jews and Gentiles, Israel and Rome, ooh, they hate each other, to put it mildly. But their hatred for Jesus Christ is mutual. Mutual. And just like today, various and sundry groups who don't get along with each other can at least agree they don't like Christianity, they don't like the Christian Bible, they don't like Jesus Christ. So there's a concerted effort to oppose the Lord Jesus Christ Back then, just like there is today, hatred for Jesus Christ brings together strange bedfellows. People you wouldn't expect to get along. Oh, they'll get along if it means getting rid of Jesus. <laughs> In Acts chapter 4, Acts 4, Acts 4, we see the fulfillment of Psalm 2. Acts 4, 25. God, who by
by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Christ, anointed Messiah, they're interchangeable. Acts 4, 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. See the conspiracy between Herod Antipas, king of Galilee, Pontius Pilate, Roman governor of Judea, with the Gentiles, Roman troops, and the people of Israel, the apostate chief priests, the scribes, the elders, Pharisees, Sadducees, temple guards, they all have united together in order to murder Jesus Christ. Psalm 22.16 Psalm 22.16 God had already determined and this was written a thousand years earlier before the cross Psalm 22 David, King David Speaking of Messiah, this is a messianic psalm. For dogs, Psalm 22, 16, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Those are the gawkers, the onlookers, standing at the foot of Calvary's cross, watching the Lord Jesus die, suffer, die. They pierced my hands and feet. That isn't stoning. Crucifixion. Crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet when David wrote that. The Holy Spirit guided David to know what was ahead. Now, David didn't fully grasp what he was writing. But the Holy Spirit, through David, did know. Israel won't be alone in this. Crucifixion is required, and that's where Rome comes in. The Roman official enters the scene, and he will authorize the, the death of Messiah. Of course, Israel wanting that, desiring that. Pontius Pilate, the prefect or the governor of Judea, from approximately A.D. 26 to 36. I'll show you this. We bring out our good old friend, the map of Palestine. We haven't seen that in a while. Pilate's headquarters were here in Caesarea, about a two days journey from Jerusalem. Pilate has temporarily relocated to Jerusalem, because remember this is Passover, to keep the peace in case there's a riot. Pilate is down here in Jerusalem. It's about a two days journey. And here he is in Jerusalem at Herod's palace. Herod is king of Galilee up here. And that's Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great of Matthew 2, the slaughter of the 
young children, two and under, in Bethlehem, Judah. Luke 23, verse 1. The whole multitude, Israel's unbelieving leaders, bring Jesus to Pilate. If I, I'll remove the map here, don't need that, so quick appearance, get rid of this for a moment, Herod's palace, where Pontius Pilate is, they're in Jerusalem, Herod's palace, where Pilate is, is somewhere here. Caiaphas and Annas, they're somewhere in this vicinity. Northwest of the temple complex, here's Herod's area, here's Herod's palace. Pilate's temporary residence there. So we can put that back. Pilate. The name Pilate means armed with a spear. Various insurrections were undertaken while Pilate was in office. Not in the Bible, but in secular history, in Jewish history, Roman history. Pilate and the Jews didn't get along with each other, like I said. Pontius Pilate was afraid of the Jews. One more problem between him and them, and he'd have to appear before the Roman Emperor. Now, after the death of Christ, Pilate did have to go to Rome. And by that time, it was no longer Emperor Tiberius Caesar. It was now Emperor Caligula. And he was no friend of Pilate. What ultimately happened to Pontius Pilate after Calvary About five years after the cross, it's speculated Pilate committed suicide. He was deposed, exiled, and apparently took his life. That's Pontius Pilate. That's about five years from now. In Matthew 27, we'll teach that now. Matthew 27, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Judas Iscariot, only in Matthew here. Judas Iscariot evidently didn't believe that Jesus would be condemned to death. But he was. And when Judas realized that the apostate Jews had convicted and would now execute Jesus, they're bringing Jesus to Pilate. 
When Judas sees that, he kills himself. He hangs himself. Acts 1, you go to Acts 1, it says, Judas' body fell. It was disemboweled. His guts gushed out. At the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, there's an earthquake in the area. As Judas is hanging, the earthquake snaps the rope, sending his body face first, headlong, onto, I guess, jagged rocks. And that's the end of Judas Iscariot. Contrast that pitiful end with Peter's. Repentance, converting back to the truth. Whereas Peter denied Jesus three times. And when the Lord looked on Peter, Peter remembered, and he went out and wept bitterly. Peter remembered the word of the Lord. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter is being recovered from the snare of the devil. What happened to Judas? Well, Judas is a lost man. Peter was a saved man. Is a saved man. Judas is a lost man. He went to confess his sin to an apostate priesthood. And he took his own life. Okay. That's the end of Judas Iscariot. Back to Luke. Have to move along in Luke. Luke 23, 1. Again. <laughs> How many times do I have to reread it? <laughs> And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. What? From where in the world did this accusation come? Remember in our last lesson, I told you not to forget. You probably did. Matthew 26, 65. Behold now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? 66, Matthew 26, 66. They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Why? He's guilty of death because of blasphemy. Mark. Mark. 14, Mark 14, 64. Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Blasphemer, guilty of death. They had also accused him of endeavoring to destroy Herod's temple. That was a lie. Now as they come before Pilate, what is the accusation? Pilate, he wants to tear down our temple. Well, Pilate wouldn't care about that. Big deal. I'm not a Jew. I don't observe Judaism. Let him tear it down. No. Pilate, he's a blasphemer. That's why we've brought him. Pilate wouldn't care to hear about anything related to Jewish religion. I am not interested in him claiming to be your Messiah. I don't fool with religious matters. I'm not an arbitrator of Judaism and its practices and beliefs. So, 
Do you see what they did? They changed the charges. An accusation that Jesus would destroy Herod's temple. Well, that wouldn't be weighty in Pilate's court. He's a blasphemer. That wouldn't hold any attention of Pilate there either. Pilate is not a religious man in Judaism anyway. I wouldn't bother to mess with religious controversies. So without telling Jesus what they would do, they accused him of something else. And as they come before Pilate, the charge is he's guilty of not blasphemy, but treason. Jesus, Luke 23, Luke 23, see that? Verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Hmm. He perverts the nation. No. Wow. Is that ironic? He perverts the nation. Oh, what are they doing? This is backward. He doesn't pervert the nation. They do. They have. He perverts the nation. He's corrupting our nation. Verse 2. And forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. He says that he is Christ the King. Had they been walking in faith, they would have seen him as king. No, it's not he says he's king, it's he is king. Okay. They claim Jesus is a, is a, a self-appointed king, a messiah. And this topic of forbidding to give tribute to Caesar... He forbids to give tribute to Caesar. Hmm? Oh, really? That's a lie. That's a lie. These religious Jews are lying again, bearing false witness, breaking the ninth commandment. Again, they don't mind. They don't care. Luke 20 Luke 20, verse 19. Remember this? Earlier in the Passion Week, Luke 20, 19. And the chief priests and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him. And they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. And they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Pilate. Okay. Let's trip up Jesus in his words. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. Oh, he does, huh? But you don't believe him. <laughs> they haven't believed him these last three years, but he does teach the way of God truly. Empty talk. 22. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. The penny, the denarius. Should we give tribute to Caesar or no? Well, bring the penny here. Bring the denarius. Let's see. Whose image? Whose superscription is on it? It's Caesar's. It is? Well, then it's his. 
Give it back to him. The coins are his. It's his government mint. Responsible for those coins. Yes, you give tribute to Caesar. It is lawful to give tribute to Caesar. Daniel 2, you are under the Gentiles, Israel. Those Gentile world powers will rule you until I sit on David's throne. Submit to Rome. So Jesus said, it is lawful. You should give taxes to Rome. Give Caesar's money back to Caesar. Just a few days later, two days later, Luke 23, 2, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Lie, that's a lie. The opposite is true. The opposite. There is no shame here. There is no justice here. There is no integrity here. They just want to get rid of Jesus whatever way they can, however they can. If they must lie, they will lie. If they must blackmail, they'll blackmail. We'll see that. He forbids to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. Oh, now Pilate would certainly want to hear this. It's a matter of insurrection, overthrowing the Roman government. Pilate is obligated to hear this. So apostate Israel changed the charges against Jesus Christ in order to better appeal to Pilate here. Another lie. He says that he himself is Christ the King. Luke 23, 2, verse 3. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the King of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it, you said it. Are you the king of the Jews? Art thou the king of the Jews? Back in Matthew, let me flip to Matthew. I'll show you Matthew 27, 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Isaiah 53, 7 again. He's not opening his mouth. 1 Peter chapter 2. He's staying quiet. He's not fighting back. 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word. Doesn't answer Pilate. Jesus is silent here. As with the Jewish trials, so he fulfills prophecy again. Shh. He says nothing. In so much that the governor marveled greatly. Never has Pilate seen such a man stand before him in these court proceedings. Jesus doesn't fight back. He doesn't answer. Most of the time he answers occasionally. Men have come before Pilate. I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Huh? Some Guess full enough. I'm guilty, I'm guilty. But Jesus is silent. Pilate is shocked. He's amazed. He's stunned. Who is this? As this Roman trial 
unfolds. Pilate sees more spiritual light. I'll show you that. If we come back to John 18, John 18, John 18, verse 33. Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? <laughs> Pilate answering, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? That's a racial slur. A Jew. That's an insult there. Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He will be given over to Gentiles. Who will give him over to Gentiles? His best friend, his most trusted apostle, gives him over to the corrupt Jewish leaders, Judas Iscariot. And then those corrupt religious leaders hand him over to Rome. The nation Israel itself betrayed its Messiah to the pagan Gentiles. John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Not now, not now. My kingdom is not now. But the day is coming when I will have a kingdom here. For now, this is the evil world system until I return. And I purge all the offices of government in earth. John 18, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? What would this truth have to do with any of this? Pilate doesn't care. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. No fault at all. That's important. No fault at all. Pilate recognizes Jesus is an innocent man. Innocent. This is a truly innocent person in my court. Now come back to Luke 23. Luke 23, 4. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Remember, I might as well teach it. I've been postponing this since chapter 19. Now that we are preparing for the crucifixion, Remember in Luke 19, Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Daniel's 69th week expired. One week left. Seven year tribulation. Future after the cross. Messiah will die after the 69th week of Daniel ends. Well, there he dies. Okay? That's today. That's today. He will die as they're holding the Passover nationally. 
ever since he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, remember Exodus, Exodus 12, back to Exodus 12, Exodus 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb, your Passover lamb, shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Verse 3. And the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Okay. The lamb is to be without blemish, a male of the first year. You take the lamb on the tenth. You pin it up. You confine it. You watch it. It should not be sick. It should not be lame. I want a lamb without blemish to be slaughtered as the Passover animal. Verse 6. You shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. There, to take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses where they eat it. Pin up the Passover lamb on the 10th. Watch it for three days. One, two, three, and kill it on the 14th at even. 14th at even, that's the Passover held, eaten. Watch the Passover lamb and then kill it as a perfect sacrifice without blemish. No problems. If we go over to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. See the connection here? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The shedding of the Passover lamb's blood, going all the way back to Egypt, the first Passover, all the way up to where we are now in Christ's earth and ministry, 1,500 years. That shed blood of that animal, that Passover lamb, that caused God to spare Israel, so they won't get wrath. That blood of that Passover lamb points to the shed blood of the sinless Son of God. He is the ultimate. He is the fulfillment. He is the ultimate Passover. He's the fulfillment. He is the antitype. The type was the Passover lamb. The antitype to which it was pointing, is Jesus Christ. Come over to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, 19. Listen, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. His sinlessness. His sinless blood. Sinless shed blood. Now, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, four days ago, Israel was to watch him in faith. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now, you go back to Palm Sunday, and you... Read all those passages up to where we are now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Here through here. Jesus was teaching in the temple, in the area of Jerusalem. In the day, he was 
performing miracles, healings. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's teaching God's word. He's defending his father's ministry, his father's doctrine. This isn't my father's house. This is a den of thieves. He is impeccable. He is trustworthy. He's working with his heavenly father in the family business. I'm about my father's business. Luke 2. Where Israel's religious leaders have failed miserably, Jesus Christ triumphs. I represent my father. My father's will is what matters to me. Israel's apostate religious leaders, they're doing whatever they want. Whatever they want. Teaching whatever they want. Satan's doctrine. That's why they eventually decide that's how we'll get rid of him. We'll use Judas, his most trusted apostle, to do it. Instead of watching Messiah in faith, and see, yes, he's fulfilling prophecy here and here and here. And he's teaching sound Bible doctrine here and here and here. He's confirming the gospel of the kingdom with miracles. He answers their trick questions. He's defending the times of the Gentiles idea. Israel submits to Rome. Israel submits to the Gentiles. Pay tribute to Caesar. He answers their resurrection Question, trick question there. What's the greatest commandment? Answer that one too. Okay. Instead of appreciating Jesus Christ, they proceeded to be dishonest. Let's entangle him in his words. Let's see if we can get him to discredit himself. They purposed underhandedly to apprehend him. They weren't watching him in faith during this time here. They observed him in unbelief. And they killed him, not in faith, in unbelief. Unbelief. See how they're behaving? Lying? Sneaking around at night when the people are in bed? So on. Pilate, the short time that he is with Jesus, Pilate, is more willing, more open to the truth here. Have you noticed? Whereas the individuals who have the Hebrew Bible, they teach, they copy the Hebrew Bible. That Bible that points them to faith in Christ Jesus there, the Bible they ignore. They have the truth in their hands, but not in their heart. They don't see the truth about Jesus, but Pilate, a pagan, heathen, idolatrous Roman, who doesn't have a Hebrew Bible, Pilate sees. He confesses what Israel doesn't want to admit. Whereas Israel was saying Jesus perverts the nation. He tells us not to give tribute to Caesar. On and on and on with those accusations. Pilate, he hears the case and his conclusion is I find no fault in him. He's innocent. 
Pilate doesn't see anything wrong with Jesus of Nazareth. But Israel does. Ooh, what a rebuke. God puts this into the record of Scripture. Whereas somebody who doesn't have a Bible sees Bible truth. The people who have the Bible don't see the Bible truth. That's because the people who have the Bible don't want to see the Bible truth. Oftentimes true today. In Luke, I have to move here, in Luke 23, verse 4, Pilate says to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Several times, Pilate utters that expression, I find no fault in him. Verse 5. Luke 23, 5, and they were the more fierce, insistent, urgent, belligerent about it, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. He stirs up the people. He excites them. They're insistent. They will not let. They will not let. Pilate. Let Jesus go. Israel is determined. To get Pilate to execute him. Convince Pilate. One way or another. Pilate. We'll put him to death. We'll guarantee that. Luke 23, 5. He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. My map is not there, so you will have to imagine. <laughs> Galilee is up north here. Judea down south. We're in Judea. This Jesus of Nazareth, he's a troublemaker. He started with this silliness in Galilee, and he's come down here to Judea. He's a pest. He is a nuisance. Hmm. That's what they say about the Apostle Paul, too, <laughs> in the book of Acts. Jesus on trial in Luke. Look at the parallels when the Apostle Paul is on trial in Acts. Luke is writing Luke and Acts, companion books. Just as sinners oppose the Lord Jesus Christ in his own flesh, here in Luke, so they oppose the Lord Jesus Christ working through the Apostle Paul in Acts years later. Satan never quits. Sinful flesh doesn't stop either. Luke 23, 5. He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. Yes, he is. Jesus of Nazareth, of Galilee, up north. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Like I told you, as these moments pass, Pontius Pilate is coming to a greater understanding of spiritual truth here. This man is innocent. 
I don't want to sentence him to death. Pilate is under conviction here. It becomes more and more apparent that Pilate is increasing in awareness. There's something about this man before me. Something is different about him. We'll see that later in another study. When Pilate sees that the Jews insist, you put him to death. No, but he's innocent. Pilate tries to escape this responsibility here. So he defers them to Herod Antipas. King Herod Antipas, oh, if Jesus of Nazareth is from Galilee, then go bring him to King Herod Antipas of Galilee. Let Herod handle this matter. Whew. Whew. I'm off the hook on this one. I don't have to discharge my duties. Herod will take care of it. Pilate attempts to get out of this. He is in a political vice, a tight spot. The pressure is on Pilate. If I upset these Jews, we've already had prior disagreements. If I don't give the Jews their way, they will report me to the Roman emperor and I will have to go before the emperor there and defend myself. So Pilate is aware the Jews want him to condemn Jesus, but he knows Jesus isn't worthy of death. He's not worthy of condemnation. Let me send him to Herod, Antipas. Herod is in Jerusalem at this time. Herod is a Judaistic observer. He is observing Judaism, a nominal Jew. He's, Herod is actually an Edomian, Edomite. Luke 3, look at this, Luke 3, 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, that's the second, Tetrarch of Iturea and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, See these expressions here? These names? This is the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Give tribute to Caesar. That's Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea. There's Pilate. There's Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee. Verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. Annas, the old man Caiaphas, his son-in-law. We've seen all. These names now, haven't we? Luke 23. Luke 23. This is special to Luke. Luke 23, verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves." Pilate and Herod were enemies. 
bitter enemies before this. But their dislike, their contempt for Jesus Christ brings them together. And now they're made friends. Luke 23, 7. Herod is at Jerusalem, not far from Pilate. So the second phase of the second part of Jesus' trial is now underway. He's gone before Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. One, two, three. Jewish trials, religious trials. Now, the Gentile, the Roman, the secular trials. He went before Pilate once, then Herod Antipas, finally Pilate again. Only in Luke do we learn of this. Herod Antipas, court scene. Luke 23, 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Herod Antipas is a curiosity seeker, like a great many today. What can impress me? Now, is Herod searching for the truth and faith? No, no, doesn't appear to be that way to me. You come back to Matthew, Matthew, recall Matthew 14, Matthew 14, verse 1. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. This was, what, 18 months, I would estimate, prior to Calvary. So 18 months before Jesus stood before Herod Antipas, Herod Antipas had killed John the Baptist, beheaded him. When Herod heard of Jesus working miracles and preaching and so on, Herod's conscience was pricked, convicted. He wondered if Jesus was actually John the Baptist, come back, perhaps reincarnated, come back from the dead. But we don't see Jesus meeting Herod until here in Luke 23. You can also see Mark 6. We'll look at Mark 6. Mark 6. John's death here. Mark 6. About a year and a half before Calvary. Mark 6. 14. And King Herod heard of him. That's Jesus. For his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. There is evidence that John the Baptist. Preached to Herod. Even after Herod had imprisoned him. Before executing John. John would preach to Herod. Herod Antipas. Come to Luke 9. Come to Luke 9. John certainly did tell Herod about Jesus of Nazareth. Luke 9. Luke 9, 7. Now Herod the teacher heard of all that was done by him. That's Christ. And he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead and of some that Elias had appeared and of others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, 
John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. Luke 9, 9. Herod desired to see Jesus. Now, all these months have passed. A year and a half has passed. Luke 23, verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. For he was desirous to see him of a long season, many months, because he had heard many things of him, and be from John the Baptist and others, but chiefly John the Baptist. And he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. If Jesus is a miracle worker, I want to see him perform a miracle for me. This is all light-hearted. No faith here. My flesh wants to be entertained. Let me watch Jesus work a miracle for me. Luke 23, 9. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Isaiah 53, 7. Again, I keep referring to it let me read it. Whether before apostate Israel, or Pontius Pilate, or King Herod, Jesus fulfills prophecy by saying nothing. Simply by staying silent, quiet. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He's not fighting back. He's not talking back. I alluded to this. You can look at it. First Peter, First Peter two, First Peter two, verse. 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, made fun of, criticized, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Luke 23, 10, and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. There they are, insulting him again before Herod, accusing him of this and that. Who are they? It's the chief priests and the scribes, the leaders of religion in Israel, the Bible copyists, the teachers of the law of Moses, dishonest, deceitful. They lie about him before King Herod. So Herod is biased against him. They lied about him before Pilate. Pilate wasn't swayed. But here we have them working again. Most dastardly. No honesty, no integrity here, no impartiality. They lie about Jesus of Nazareth before Herod. Luke 23, 11. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. There's verbal assault. And I would go so far as to say physical violence here. The men of war, these strong men, they're violent. The Lord Jesus is subjected to more harsh mistreatment. He's mocked, ridiculed, belittled. 
Herod and his men of war. There's no justice here either, huh? No justice for Christ Jesus. They array him in a gorgeous robe. You're a king? Here. Here is an old discarded robe. Herod can part with it. Put it on him. Jesus, now you're dawned in royal apparel. Pilate and his men would do something similar later. Herod and his men of war. They set him at naught. Reduced him using their words. Throwing punches. Character assassination. And again, let me remind you, he permits it. Jesus Christ is not resisting. The Lord of glory lets them. He allows them to do this to him. And just to imagine, they are just one blink away from destruction if he wanted. No. I won't resist. Luke 23, verse 12, In the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together. Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate. For before they were at enmity between themselves. We can't stand each other. But we can all laugh in unison. <laughs> we certainly show Jesus of Nazareth who's in charge. We can all get rid of him too, together. Pilate can't escape this. He passed Jesus off to Herod. Herod brings him back to Pilate. Pilate has to make that choice. Pilate is still a free moral agent. Herod is a free moral agent. All these unbelievers, free moral agents, God isn't forcing anybody to do anything. The devil made them do it. No, no, no. Responsibility is on them. Poor choices. Judas and his poor choice. Peter and his poor choices. Annas, Caiaphas, Sanhedrin, chief priests, scribes, Pharisees. Look at all these poor choices. Sinful men. Peter, of course, is a believer. Behaving, conducting himself like an unbeliever. They're made friends, Pilate and Herod. And so now, we stop here. Back to Pilate one more time. And this is where Jesus will be sentenced. To be crucified. So, that's where I intended to stop. <laughs> Father God, thank you for your word. In Christ's name, amen.